Welcome to this CUBE Conversation with Fortinet. I'm Lisa Martin. John Madison joins me, the CMO and EVP of products. John, welcome back to the program. Thanks, Lisa. Good to be here. Good to see you. So, so much has changed since I last saw you. The move to remote work caused by the pandemic led so many organizations to invest in modern networking and security technologies. And we see, you know, the rise in the threat landscape that protecting digital assets is becoming even more and more urgent because the threats are continuing to escalate. Talk to me about some of the things that you're seeing with this current threat landscape. Yeah, well, it keeps changing, that's for sure. Um, you saw some recent surveys where, you know, now companies are saying um, in terms of where employees are located, you know, 25% uh, that expecting to be in the office, 25% expected, expected to be permanently in the home. And then there's this big 50% of hybrid, which uh, we think will move a bit more towards the office as people get back in the office, but uh, that's going to take some time. We're actually starting to move back in the office here in Santa Clara, Sunnyvale, but it's very different in every region in the US and regulations and laws around the world. And so we think it's going to be very much work from anywhere. There's a bit of travel styling as well. And so this, this work from anywhere concept is, is going to be very important to customers going forward and the ability to change the dynamics of that ratio as they go forward. Right, you see, yeah, this work from anywhere that over last year overnight sort of became an absolute essential. But now, as you said, we're going to have this hybrid model of some going back, some staying home, and the security and the perimeter is dissolving. When you look at supporting customers and their work from anywhere, um, their new work from anywhere model, what are some of the things that are top of mind that you're hearing from customers? Well, I, you know, it's, I sometimes hear this perimeter's disappearing. I think in some ways it's moving to the user and the devices. Uh, and there's this concept called zero trust network access which I've said on many occasions should be zero trust application access, but they named it that way, um, which is going to be important technology because as I said, it kind of moves that perimeter then to that user and uh, previous technology that we had, um, VPN technology was good technology. And in fact, a lot of companies, we go back to when the pandemic started last year, uh, put a lot of people on the VPN technology as quickly as possible. And it was reasonably robust, but as we go forward, what we're going to have to do is make sure that perimeter uh, at that perimeter, uh, users only get access to the applications they're using rather than the whole network. Uh, eventually when they're on the network, they need to make sure that it's segmented so they can't go everywhere as well. And so there's this zero trust network access or zero trust or zero trust access. There's lots of kind of different versions of it. There's going to be a very important concept for users. The other piece of it, I think, is also that uh, it needs to be more intuitive to users. Anything you kind of have users do like the VPN where you had to kind of dial in and or bring up your bring up your connection and your and your IP set connection, et cetera, et cetera, uh, means that people tend not to use it. And so to make it intuitive and automatic is going to be really important. Intuitive and automatic. One of the things that we also saw was this massive rise in digital transformation last year, right? SaaS adoption, these SaaS applications keeping many of us in collaboration. So I'm thinking you know, in that sense with the perimeter changing and the work from anywhere, this consistent secure internet connection among users at the branch or the branch of one has to be there to keep organizations productive and safe. How is the uh, Fortinet enabling the the ZTNA, uh, this evolution of uh, VPN? Yeah, that's another piece of it. So not only are users on and off the network or traveling. So that, the, that also the applications are moving. So a lot of them have moved from data centers to public cloud in the form of infrastructure or, or SaaS. We're now seeing customers actually move some applications uh, towards the building or building compute or edge compute. So the applications keep moving, which also causes this problem. And so another a function of zero trust access or ZTNA is to not care where the application is uh, you rely on some technology, it's called proxy technology, which allows the proxy to track where the applications are. Uh, and for us, that sits inside our, our firewalls uh, and that makes it very flexible. And so we've been able to kind of just ramp up that proxy uh, against a policy engine, whether it be in the data center or in the cloud or even on your premise, even integrated inside a branch or something like that. It's gonna be very important because as you just said, those applications will just keep moving into different areas and different zones as you go forward. And that's probably going to be permanent for 
uh, a lot of organizations. So, yeah. it, it, so they haven't renamed it Zero Trust Application Access like you, you think it should be, but what, when organizations are looking into Zero Trust Network Access, what, should, what are some of the key things that they need to be looking for and mindful of? Yes, and, and so it's probably the, you know, the number one conversation they've had over the last six months. Uh, I think people initially just had to get something working. Uh, now they're looking seriously at a longer, longer term architecture uh, for their access, their user access and device access. Uh, I think what I find is that um, something like zero trust network access is more of a use case across multiple components. And so if you look inside it, you need a client component endpoint uh, you need a proxy in front of the cloud capabilities. You need a policy engine. You need to um, use identity-based systems. Uh, if you haven't got, uh, if you can't get an agent on the device, you may need a NAC system. Um, and so usually what customers find is I've got four or five current different vendors in those areas. And, and cybersecurity vendors are not the best at working together. I wish they were because then we'd be better for customers. And so trying to get two vendors to work is hard enough, trying to get five or six is, is really hard. And so what they're looking at over time is to say, maybe I'll get the minimum basic ZTNA working. And then as I go forward, for example, what they really want is this continuing posture uh, assessment. Well, you can do that with some EDR technology, but is that EDR technology integrated into your policy engine? No. So I think what customers are saying is, let me start with the base ZTNA uh, with maybe two vendors. And then as I go forward, implement a you know a fabric or a platform approach to get everything working together because it's just too hard with with five or six vendors. Right. Is there I'm curious if there's a shared responsibility model with customers working with different vendors. What actions and security responsibilities fall on the customer that they need to be aware of? Well and it also comes back to this, you know, this conversion of networking and security. And I, and I've said a few times I've definitely seen CIOs and CISO, security teams and networking teams working much more closely. And especially when you've got a use case now that uh, goes across security items and networking items, you know, networking, the proxy has always been in the control of the networking team. Endpoint security has always been the, you know, the security team. It's just forcing this convergence, not just of the technologies itself, uh, but of the organizations inside enterprises. Well, and that's a challenging one for every organization is getting, you know, if you're talking about it in general, the business folks, the IT folks, now this is not just a security problem. This is a problem for the entire corporation as we just saw with the Colonial Pipeline. Ransomware is now becoming a household name. These are business critical board level discussions, I imagine, on the security side. How are, is Fortinet helping customers kind of bridge that gap between the biz folks and the IT folks where security is concerned? Yeah, no, ransomware has been around quite a while. I think two years ago, uh, we saw a lot of it in, in the schools, K, K-12 schools in the US. I think they've, they've, they're picking some richer targets now. Uh, the Colonial one, I think there was a, a 4 million ransom. I think they, we man, they managed to get some of that money back. But you know, instead of you know, demanding 5,000 or 10,000 from a small business or a school, they're obviously demanding millions from these larger companies. And uh, you know one of the problems with ransomware is you know it still relies heavily on social engineering. Yeah, I, I don't think you can eliminate that people clicking on stuff. You know a very small percentage still. I think what it means is you have to put some more proactive things in place, like the zero trust, like micro segmentation, um, like web application firewalling, all these capabilities to try and make your systems as strong as possible. To then put in detection and response systems to assume that someone's clicking on something somewhere uh, just to help. But it's it's definitely the environment, uh, you know, the threat environment. It's not really got more sophisticated. Yes, there are still advanced threats. I I, I fear more about those weaponized APTs and state sponsored, um, but there's definitely a huge volume of ransomware now going after, you know, not only, you know, meat processing factories, but pipelines and critical infrastructure as we go forward. That's that's the more worrying. Right. You bring up a good point about sort of people being one of the, the biggest challenges from a security perspective. Clicking on links, not checking to see if a link is is um, is bogus or legitimate. So help me understand a little bit more how Zero Trust can help maybe take some of that human error out of the equation. Well, because I think before, you know, when you got access, when you're off the network and you got access to the network, uh, you got access to everything. 
okay, so why don't you run the network? And I think the Colonial Pipeline was a good example where traditionally operational technology networks, physical networks were separate from the IT network and they had something called an air gap. And that air gap meant you really couldn't get to it. Now, when people had to be remote because of the pandemic, they started taking these air gaps out. And so now you had remote access. And so again, when you when they got that remote access and they got into the network, they could, the network was very flat and you could see everything, you could go anywhere. Uh, and so that's what Zero Trust does. It kind of says, I, I kind of did this Zero Trust approach to you that I'm only going to allow you access to this application. And I'm going to keep checking on you to make sure you, you are who you say you are on a continuous basis. Uh, and that really provides a bit more safety. Now, I still we still think you need to put things like segmentation in place and some other capabilities and monitoring and everything else, but it just narrows the attack surface down from this giant network approach to a specific application. Narrowing that is the right direction. How do organizations, when you're working with customers, how do they go, how do they evolve from a traditional VPN to zero trust? What are some of the steps involved in that? Well, I think it's, you know, what's interesting is customers still have data centers. In fact, you know, some of the customers who have legacy applications will have a data center for a long time. And uh, in fact, what I find is even if you've implemented zero trust to a certain you know, population, employee population, they still have VPNs in place. And sometimes they use them for the IT folks. Sometimes they use them for specialized developers and stuff like that. And so I think it's going to be like everything. Everything goes 100% this way and it stays this way. And so it's going to be hybrid for a while where we see VPN technology and zero trust together. Uh, we, you know, our, our approach is that you can have both together and it's both on the same platform. Uh, and then it'll just sort of gradually evolve as you go forward. What are some of the things that you're looking forward to in the next year as this hybrid environment continues, but hopefully things start to open up more? What are some of the things that we can expect to hear and see from Fortinet? Well, I'm looking forward to getting out of my home office. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I've been imprisoned here for- I agree with you on months. that. So we'll try that. I'm, you know, I, I always thought I traveled too much before and now I'm contemplating on you know, the travel piece, but from, you know, uh, Fortinet's perspective, um, you know, our goal is to make sure that, you know, our customers can increase or make sure they can protect themselves. And so we want to help them uh, and, and keep working with them such that they put best practices in place and they start architecting longer term to implement things like zero trust or SASE or, some of these other capabilities. And so, you know, I think the, uh, we've had a lot of interest with customers on these, on these virtual sessions. I'm really looking forward to getting them back in our, in our new building, our new executive briefing center, which we're opening up uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, you may have more of those face-to-face -face and whiteboarding conversations with customers. Oh, that sounds so exciting. I agree with you on the travel front, but going from traveling a ton to none was a big challenge. But also, I imagine it'll be great to actually get to collaborate with customers again and partners. You know, you can only do so much by Zoom. Talk to me a little bit about some of the things on the partnership front that we might be seeing. Yeah, our partners, you know, we're 100% partner driven company and partners are very important to us. Uh, and, you know, and that's why we always, when we introduce new technology, uh, we work with the partners to make sure they they understand it. So, for example, we provide free what we call NSE training to all our partners. And then we also work with them very closely to put systems in their labs and then demos and make sure they can architect. And so, partners are, are really important to us. And you know, making sure uh, that they can provide value as part of the solution set to their customers because customers trust them. And so, we want to make sure that we work with our partners closely so they can help the customer implement and architect the solutions as they go forward. That trust is critical, right? I mean, we can talk about that at every event, every CUBE conversation, the trust that an, uh, a customer has in you, the trust that you have in a partner and vice versa. That whole trust circle kind of goes along the lines with what we're talking about in terms of being able to, to establish that trust so that that threat landscape, that's probably only going to continue to get bigger is in the trusted hands of folks like Fortinet and your partners to be able to enable those customers to narrow that threat landscape. Yeah, yeah, and so it could be a, the smallest partner to the largest service provider. Uh, we don't mind, we, we, we want to make sure that we're working with them uh, the, to provide that uh, implementation for the customers. And again, you, the word trust is sometimes overused, but that's what customers are looking for. So John, point me to point our, our audience to some of the information that they can find on .com about zero trust. What are some of the things that you think are great calls to action for the audience? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I think it depends on what level you want to get into. We, we have a bunch of assets 
videos and training that start at the very highest level, you know, why is zero trust something you, you need to implement? And then it goes down into the more details and then even the architecture, long-term architecture and connectivity and implementation. So there's a lot of assets on foodnet.com. Uh, if you go on our training sessions, there's, there's we all our trainings free to our customers. And so you can go in all those NSC levels and, and look at the, the capabilities. Uh, so yeah, definitely it's a, it's an area of high interest from our customers. But as I say to them, it's more of a journey. Yes, you can implement something today really quickly, uh, but will that work for you over the long term in making sure you can take all the information uh, from the, like I said, you know, how is the, what is the posture of that device? What is the device that an agent doing? You know, is my contextual engine integrated as well? So it's a journey for customers, uh, and 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 but you can start with something simple, but you need to have that plan for that journey in place. I imagine though, John, it's a journey that is either accelerating or with the threat landscape and some of the things that we've already talked about is becoming an absolutely board critical uh, um, co conversation. So and on that journey, does Fortinet network with customers to accelerate certain parts of it because you know, these businesses have been pivoting so much in the last year and they've got to not just survive, but now thrive in this new landscape, this new hybrid work from home, work from anywhere environment, and also with, with more threats. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And so, um, you know, even us internally are implementing it, starting with the most critical assets first. So let's say, you know, I've got somebody working on source code, they should be the first ones to get the zero trust implementation. I've got somebody asking from the internet to search for stuff. Maybe they're okay for now, but um, yeah. So you kind of prioritize your assets and users uh, against you know the threat, uh, and then implement. That's why I'm saying you can roll it out across everyone as you know a, a certain version of it. But I think it's better to prioritize first the most important assets and IP, uh, and then roll it out that one. Great advice. But some a lot of those because a lot of those assets are still sitting in the data center. Right. So they're not sitting in the cloud. Right. John, great advice. Thank you so much for joining me. Good to see you, glad all is well, and that you will be able to get out of your home office. You're just days away from that. I'm sure that's hey. going to feel great. It certainly is, and thank you, Lisa. Nice to see you. For John Madison, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching this CUBE Conversation.